Welcome. We're just gonna hang tight for a couple, couple more minutes. Um, just a little uh, background um, about how things will kind of work today. Um, so what we will do is we do ask, and most of you are, 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 are already muted. Um, we do ask that if just during the presentation when Nick's speaking, if you guys can be sure to, to be muted, just that helps so that everyone else, you know, you can hear them clearly. Um, also, if you have any questions during the presentation, um, if you wanna just write them in the chat um, option that's at the bottom of your list, um, at the bottom of your screen, um, Nick will make sure to um, answer all questions at the end of the presentation. Um, we find that's a little bit easier than trying to answer them as we go. So um, be sure, you know, if you, have any questions anytime you can certainly write them in the chat and we will be sure to address them um we still have a few more people we've had a few more people popping on right now um so i might give we might give like two more minutes and then we'll get started thank you guys for joining us on this monday at lunchtime Yeah, I figure, you know, Mondays can be a little hectic. So, you know, trying to fit it in at lunch, I like to give a few minutes. Well, Nick, do you want to just go ahead and get started, introduce yourself, and we'll, um, you know, people as they come in, they can catch up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy. To, it's, uh, it's a few minutes after the hour, so I'm happy to begin. Okay. Uh, you just confirming, Angela, you can still hear me nice and clear? Yes, I can. All right, very good. Well, in that case, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, everyone, thanks so much for attending this uh, presentation on cartilage, what it is and why it matters. Uh, my name is Nick Law or Nicholas Law, whichever you choose to call me. I am a physical therapist with Physical Therapy at ACAC. I work at our Profit Road location, which many of our listeners may not be familiar with, but we have a location up on Profit Road. If uh, you know where the relatively new Wawa is, we're in that a medical complex building right beside the Wawa, so up kind of towards the airport. I am an orthopedic certified specialist as well as a strength and conditioning specialist. I specialize in general orthopedics, so essentially pain related to most major joints of the muscles and body. I don't deal necessarily with uh, the details of the hand or elbow. We have uh, some hand therapists that deal with that, but for most other joints um, and muscles that's uh, with orthopedic problems, I, uh, that's, that's my area. All right, so to get a very basic, uh, in one sense, a very basic presentation, we're going to talk about cartilage today. What is it and what does it do? Uh, what happens when cartilage goes bad or the pathology of cartilage? Maybe how this happens and, and how can we, very importantly, right, how can we take care of our cartilage? All right, so what is cartilage anyway? Well, a very unhelpful definition is that uh, Cartilage is a flexible connective tissue found in many parts of the body. It can bend a bit, but resist stretching. That's from simple English Wikipedia. Rather than trying to find a uh, worded definition of cartilage, though, I think it's just easier to appreciate what it is if we, if we kind of give examples of it. And it's important to note that not all cartilage is the same. There are different kinds of cartilage found in different parts of the body. Uh, they're commonly grouped into three different kinds of elastic, fibro cartilage and hyaline cartilage. So elastic cartilage you can find on the external part of your ear. 
if you grab your ear, you can kind of bend it and move it around a little bit. It's, it's not entirely just skin, but it's not quite like bone either. And that's called elastic cartilage. You can also find that in the bridge of your nose. Again, it's, it's got some stiffness to it, but it's not quite like bone, but neither is it just sort of skin. It's, that, that's cartilage for you. And that's elastic cartilage. There are a few places in our body that are made up of tissue called fibrocartilage. So you have specialized rings of tissue in your hip and shoulder called the labrum. Some people may have heard of the labrum. That helps to uh, make the socket of the hip and shoulder a little bit larger and support the joint stability. And those are, the labrum is made up of fibrocartilage. You also have little spacers in your back called intervertebral disc, and that also is a kind of fibrocartilage. Okay, you have a meniscus in your knee, again, another example of fibrocartilage. Okay, but very importantly, what, what we're gonna spend most of our, the rest of our time talking about is what's called hyaline or articular cartilage. Okay, and that's cartilage found at the ends of our bones. So again, we'll, we'll talk more about that. But that's for the rest of this presentation, what we're talking about hyaline or articular cartilage. Oh, also just for a little shock value, sharks, uh, sharks' bodies are not, sharks don't have bones. Uh, their bodies are made up of cartilage. So if you think about grabbing a shark and holding it, they don't have bony skeleton like we do, but their bodies are made up of cartilage. I have no idea how it would be classified. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about articular cartilage. Again, it's found at the ends of our bones, right? This diagram is of a knee joint, the thigh bone coming down from the top and the shin bone coming up from the bottom. And where those two bones meet together, there's a layer of tissue there called cartilage. Okay, it's about two to four millimeters thick, depending on the size and age of the individual, as where is, it's also where in the body we're talking about. You're gonna have a little bit thicker cartilage at the knee. Okay, and it's composed of two main parts. Okay, there's the, what's called the extracellular matrix that makes up the vast majority of cartilage. And then chondrocytes, which are the, the cell, the living cells. And it's um, a little breakdown of what, uh, you know, the, so the extracellular matrix is made up mainly of water, but also of these other substances called proteoglycans and type two collagen. The chondrocytes are again, the cells embedded within the cartilage that help develop and maintain and repair that extracellular matrix. Note that they are immobile, so they can't move, so that the cells cannot move from one area to another, which has implications for healing. Here's just a kind of a fancy uh, drawing explaining, showing the collagen fibrils and the proteoglycans and the chondrocytes. Uh, we really don't need to go into great detail there. Um, but there, there you have it. So extracellular matrix makes up the vast majority of the cartilage, as well as chondrocytes that help to uh, repair that extracellular matrix. Two important things to note about cartilage are that it is avascular. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute, but that means it has no blood supply. So again, we'll talk more about that in a minute. That's going to have implications for healing. Okay, so there's no direct blood supply to the cartilage. And it's also a neural, meaning there's no nerve supply. So if we were to cut someone's knee open and tap their cartilage with a probe, the underlying bone, if that pressure made it to the underlying bone, they would feel it. But if it only touched, if the pressure didn't make it to the underlying bone, the cartilage, you wouldn't actually feel anything. The cartilage actually has no nerve supply. So in the early phases of injury, because of uh, the cartilage has no nerve supply, you, you might, might not be, you might not have pain. All right, so that's just a little bit of an overview of kind of how, what cartilage is and kind of how it's made up. But what, what does cartilage do? Well, it helps provide a low friction gliding surface. If you think about your, the motion of your joints, and hopefully for most of us, when we move our joints, uh, they move fairly smoothly. If you bend your wrist up and down or open and close your hand, and, and hopefully you don't get too much, uh, hopefully it's moving fairly smoothly. And anywhere you have smooth movement that's, and the bones aren't cracking all together, well, that's because the cartilage is helping, helps to provide a very low friction environment. I read somewhere that the coefficient of friction is less than skating on ice. I mean, it's very, very just a yeah, low friction environment. Okay, and very importantly, cartilage acts as a shock absorber. 
It helps to resist and transmit compressive loads. When our joints are loaded because of gravity, the cartilage helps to resist that load and it also helps to distribute it smoothly to the underlying bone. So, and that's this really this third point that I pulled from an article. It's just a function of point number two. When cartilage does its job properly and acting as a shock absorber, that minimizes pressure to the subchondral bone. Subchondral just means below the cartilage. So when cartilage is functioning as it should, that minimizes pressure on the bone underneath. That's very, very important. Okay, so moving on fairly quickly here. And again, if you have questions at any time, feel free to uh, jot those down or write those in the chat and we'd be happy to answer them at the end. Okay, so we're gonna talk just again fairly briefly about articular cartilage pathology or pathology is just sort of referring to a disease state when something goes bad. So how does cartilage go bad? Well, there are a few diseases that can cause cartilage to um, become diseased. Uh, conditions such as avascular necrosis, which is where for some strange reason, blood supply to the bone is cut off and, and then that can cause some subsequent damage to the cartilage. But these are extremely rare and, and most of us will never have heard of them or, or be exposed to them. Traumatic injury, we'll talk a little bit you know, more about this in a minute, it can certainly cause damage to the cartilage. Again, if you, you fell off a ladder or if you were in a very serious car accident, right, that can cause such a shock to the, the cartilage that you could have an injury. But much, much, much more common is this chronic degeneration in which the breakdown of cartilage exceeds repair. So it's a, it's a chronic process, it's a long-term process in which the cartilage is slowly broken down more than it's slowly built back up. And this is the defining feature of osteoarthritis. So if, if cartilage seemed like uh, irrelevant, uh, most of us are gonna be familiar with the term arthritis. And if we live long enough, most people are gonna probably have a doctor tell them at some point that they're suffering some, from some form of arthritis somewhere in their body. Arthritis is a tremendous healthcare burden and is going to impact a large, large number of people, right? And, that, and this loss of cartilage is the defining feature of osteoarthritis. So cartilage is very important if we hope to um, ward off and keep something like arthritis from becoming too severe. Now, how does this happen? How does this chronic loss of cartilage happen over our lifespan in which it breaks down more than it repairs? Well, a very recent study notes that the mechanisms behind the catabolic, that's the breakdown, and inflammatory processes are extraordinarily complex and still poorly defined. So all that to say is that the really smart people who study these things, uh, why we lose cartilage over time and why it breaks down more than it builds up, that process is still very complex and unfortunately very poorly defined. But just because we don't know everything about why that happens doesn't mean we don't know anything about it. Okay, but I guess I should say, we'll talk more a little bit about some of the factors here in a minute. But we should note again that cartilage is avascular, right? It has no blood supply. If you strain a muscle, okay, that muscle, or if you break a bone, both of those tissues are very, are oozing with blood, with blood. And they have a very rich blood supply. Blood ha contains the, you know, has the capacity to bring kind of nutrients and nutrition to those tissues. So that's why strained muscles in broken bones have incredible healing capacity. But cartilage is avascular, doesn't have a blood supply. And so its capacity to get fresh nutrition is much more limited. Uh, and so for that reason, its healing capacity is much less than a broken bone or a torn muscle or something of the sort. But there are likely, so just, we don't know all the reasons why cartilage gets broken down down over time, but there, we can see that there are mechanical and inflammatory contributors to the chronic breakdown of cartilage. We'll talk more about those in a minute. I just wanted to show, you know, a picture, you know, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words, right? On the, we just have a, this is a knee x-ray. I'm not sure if uh, people can see my mouse curture, but on the left-hand side of the screen coming down from the top is the thigh bone. 
coming up from the bottom is the shin bone, right? And this is our knee joint. Cartilage does not show up on the x-ray. So what cartilage is represented as is the space between the bones. So on the left side, we see that there's uh, some black space running between that shin bone and thigh bone. That represents the cartilage space between the bones. Again, that's probably two to four millimeters thick, helping to resist the shock that gets put on those bones when we walk or stand or jump or run or do whatever the case may be. Okay, and on the right-hand side of the screen is a pretty fairly typical picture of someone who has you know, fairly significant knee arthritis. We can see, especially on the inside of the knee joint, where there is no more black space. And there's a, what we call a bone-on-bone -bone appearance, where there, there's kind of no more cushioning from the cartilage. There's no more cartilage there to keep the pressure on the bone from being minimized. Um, and so, it, you know, pain is a very complex phenomenon but it would not be unusual for a person with an knee x-ray like this to experience pain on the inside of their knee uh, because of the, the bone itself is now being getting too much pressure and um, doesn't like that and is gonna produce some pain so that we don't overload the pressure. So we wanna maintain cartilage uh, so that we don't overload our bones and can continue to function in a pain-free. So we mentioned that there are both mechanical and inflammatory factors that contribute to the pathology or the breakdown of cartilage, okay? So we talked about this a little bit already in one sense, but there could be acute overload, meaning a sudden one-time event that overloads the cartilage, right? If Wiley Coyote is uh, jumping, if you're jumping out of a helicopter and your parachute doesn't work and you uh, sustain a very hard fall, that, that might be enough pressure to cause a significant amount of damage to your cartilage. Again, if you jump off a ladder or if you have a car wreck or or perhaps if you have a sporting injury where there's a very, very heavy force uh, delivered to your joint, that might be enough to cause damage to the cartilage and give you an injury. So that's a, we would call that acute overload. Okay, there can also be acute underload. So if, say, for some reason, uh, you know, Stuart gets sick and he ends up in a hospital bed for a few weeks because of some stomach illness. He's not walking around and, and living life like he's playing sports like he's not used to. Uh, if he's on bed rest for a few weeks, the cartilage in his knee will actually thin out. We've done a, been a number of animal and human studies showing that when we don't give cartilage, it's normal weight bearing, it's normal loading and unloading that happens as we live our life, that the cartilage gets weaker. And, uh, and it, doesn't, it doesn't have the strength that it normally does. Okay, so underload is a, is a factor here. But again, that's probably not, probably not going to be too relevant for most of us in most parts of our life. You know that, that, that uh, more relevant, we do know that, that cartilage can be chronically overloaded. So there are certain occupations, those that involve heavy manual labor, that we do see uh, uh, people in these occupations have greater rates of cartilage loss over time. Okay, so the cartilage is subjected to, to so much load over such lengthy periods of time, it's not able to adequately recover. Um, and, and that in some way, shape or form, that contributes to the chronic breakdown of cartilage over time. Okay, we also, we'll talk more about this in a little bit, but we also know that obesity over, over time causes greater acceleration of cartilage damage. So the more weight, and that, there's a certain intuitive sense there, the more weight uh, you carry, the more pressure you put on the, the cartilage, and that may accelerate the breakdown of that tissue over time. Okay, but then there's also chronic underload. Uh, so just mean, again, we, not quite to the same extent as uh, being bedridden for, you know, for a period of time, but, but cartilage maintains its strength through being loaded, through activities that we do. So if we're not giving cartilage that stimulus through exercise, through weight, some kind of weight-bearing exercise, uh, that, that causes the cartilage to be weak. So we can think about these bottom two points, we can think about a bell curve, that there's a proper happy medium about how much pressure we, how much load, you know, again, how much, how much stress we give our cartilage. 
if we never give it enough stress, you know, we are live sedentary lifestyle, that's going to cause our cartilage to become weak and and damaged over time. But also, if we're on the other end of that bell curve, uh, you know, we're stressing it too much, whether you know through perhaps through a heavy occupational load, or or we'll talk about a few other items here in a minute. Uh, that also can contribute to the overload of you know that also is not healthy for our cartilage and can cause more breakdown over time. So I did just want to take up this uh, issue. This is kind of a little bit of an excursus. We're talking about mechanical factors that can cause the breakdown of cartilage. I did want to touch on one issue is it's a, maybe a common question that people have is what about distance running? Okay, is, is distance running going to, is that going to overload my cartilage and cause me to be more likely to have knee arthritis? And here, the evidence, they've done a lot, a lot of research on this topic, and I think the evidence is fairly overwhelmingly clear. I'm going to just zip through some of these titles, uh, but they all seem to say they all, they're all going to tend towards the same effect. Okay, running does not increase symptoms or structural progression in people with knee arthritis. Okay, anytime we talk about a study with, with arthritis, again, that's a reflection of cartilage. Loss of cartilage is the primary feature of arthritis. Um, and so if it says that running doesn't cause arthritis, that's, that's the same thing as saying it's not going to cause uh, any progression of loss of cartilage, okay? Okay, in one study, running significantly reduced osteoarthritis and hip replacement risk, okay? This was very recent. This was put out in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, and it was a little infographic on recreational running. Uh, you know, the myth is that recreational running causes knee arthritis. And here are the facts. Recreational running is not harmful for knee joint articular cartilage in runners without symptomatic knee arthritis. So if you don't have arthritis running, recreational running is not harmful. And participation in recreational running may provide a protective effect against the development of hip and knee arthritis. So if you want to keep away arthritis, uh, not only may running be something that you that is, that's neutral, but it may even help you keep it away. And again, this was as recent as March 2022. I feel pretty happy about that, sort of pulling from uh, the most up-to-date research here. So again, running is not is not Recreational running, again, that's very key to, to mention that. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but recreational running is not harmful. Recreational running is not likely to contribute to that chronic overload that would, that would lead to knee arthritis. Okay, um, this, is, this is just more of the same. I, I probably could have gotten rid of this slide, but it's just it's more evidence of the same thing that, that uh, running causes positive adaptations to cartilage and is not likely to lead to arthritis. Okay, so that was about running. What about sporting activity? Okay, what about not just sort of distance running, but sporting activity? Is soccer, basketball, football, are these things going to cause uh, progressive loss of cartilage? Okay, this was a relatively recent systematic review, and I'll just read the conclusions of the authors. We found that participants in certain sports, that is soccer or elite long distance running, and note that elite, not recreational, but elite, weightlifting and wrestling may have an increased prevalence of knee arthritis. The increased odds of knee arthritis are likely confounded by the level of play and in joint injury history. These things are, th these two underlined features are very key to understand. Again, we, could, we, we need to think about activity and cartilage health on a bell curve. Okay, chronic underload. So for people who don't do activity, who don't exercise, these people are likely to have advanced, they're more likely to have cartilage injury over time, as well as be led to have, you know, knee and hip replacement. But the bell curve also has the other end of the bell curve, where if, uh, if there is too much overload, then that also is going to be likely to contribute to injury. So the answer to the question, based on the available knowledge, is yes, for elite level athletes, under who are being subjected to very high levels of intense and very high levels of uh, volume of stress. So again, elite long distance runners, so people who are running, um, you know, not 10 to 20 miles a week, but uh, maybe 80 to 90 miles a week, 
right? Or um, soccer players, not, not, not people who are part of their recreational soccer league and just sort of, you know, playing two days a week or three days a week, but elite level soccer players who are, you know, practicing two to three hours a day for six days a week. Uh, you know, these the higher level activities are, more, yes, may contribute to an accelerated loss of cartilage, as well as what also matters is joint injury history. So uh, it's very clear evidence if you're a soccer player and you experience, because of playing soccer, you have an ACL tear or you have a meniscus tear. If you have a joint injury, like an ACL tear or a meniscus tear, that is going to accelerate the loss, that is going to accelerate your likelihood of having progressive cartilage damage over time. So I hope that makes sense that uh, we can just sort of sport injury in general, sports are all very different, so it can be very difficult to uh, throw all sports under one category. Uh, but the more, if at the elite levels, and especially if you have a joint injury history, like a, like a big ligament tear, or um, other significant injury that can accelerate your cartilage loss, but more recreational levels of, of sport play are much, much, much less likely to cause cartilage injury and are probably going to have a protective effect. Okay, so one more last slide. Uh, there are other talking about mechanical factors that um, can contribute to cartilage loss over time. Uh, this is, again, a, ve a very recent study published this year. Knee extensor muscle weakness, that's your quadricep or your thigh muscle weakness, uh, is a risk factor for the development of knee arthritis. Okay, so looking at a very large number of people, 40, gosh, almost uh, half a hundred thousand people, uh, showing that if you have a weak thigh muscle, that, that's likely to contribute to uh, cartilage loss at the knee. Again, just more, these other studies are just sort of titles showing the same thing, that if we have a, a fatty thigh muscle, not only can your thigh muscle get weak, but it can also get this fatty infiltration into it, and that's likely to associate with, uh, with cartilage injury, and even certain factors about the way you move. Okay? Again, I won't, won't go into great detail there, but there are certain factors about the way you move that um, can contribute over time to cartilage loss. So those are all what we would call mechanical factors, things that um, you know are, are, are putting a certain pressure on the joint. But, but it's not just sort of the, the load that we put on the joint, but we do know that there are certain inflammatory factors. These are very complex statements from, from a few recent studies, but uh, there are certain uh, chemical structures, chemical, uh, chemicals that are in circulation in our body um, that if they're elevated, they contribute to cartilage progression. I'm going to go ahead and I'll read this uh, second clause. Okay, so altered adipose tissue composition in overweight and obese individuals. So we talked a little bit earlier about how just sort of obesity can cause excessive actual, just actual pressure on the cartilage as we carry our weight around with us. But but one of the main effects that obesity, that being overweight, actually contributes to cartilage breakdown is that it increases the, these inflammatory chemicals that are in circulation in our body. So altered adipose tissue composition in overweight and obese individuals is known to induce low-grade systemic inflammation by causing an increase in these chemicals called cytokines, like you know, all these different interleukins and tumor necrosis factor, all these various uh, little chemicals that they can study that contribute to cartilage degradation and or disease progression. Okay, one of the ways that we see this is that high body mass index is associated with increased risk of arthritis at the first carpal metacarpal joint, that's the base of your thumb. Okay, so if you think about the very base of your thumb joint, we know that people who have elevated body mass or who are a little bit overweight have an increased likelihood of having arthritis there. Their cartilage is more likely to be damaged. But that's not a weight-bearing joint. We don't walk on our hands. And that joint, the, 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 the reason that that joint would have more arthritis can't be from the weight of the body, can't be from the, the body weight itself. It's more likely due to uh, the inflammatory component that being overweight provides. So all that to say is that dealing with uh, learning to control the low-grade inflammation that can happen through being, through being overweight is a, is a very key component of, uh, that's a very key 
contributor to cartilage loss over time, and therefore is a very key uh, component to, to dealing with cartilage loss over time. Okay, very important, right? So uh, probably the most important part of this presentation, right, is how can we take care of our cartilage, okay? We don't want to have arthritis. We don't want to be headed for a hip or knee replacement or have arthritis in our hand, right? How can we take care of our cartilage? By far, these three things are the most important things that we can do. Uh, they're not very glamorous. They're, they're not very uh, glamorous or exciting, but they are very, very important. So weight loss, nutrition, and physical activity display the strongest evidence to enhance cartilage activity. So we're just going to talk a little bit about each of those, okay? Again, it's not very glamorous. It's not very, uh, doesn't make me sound super smart, but it's just very clear that weight loss especially for those who are in overweight, has a very significant effect on reducing cartilage loss over time. In one study, every 1% weight loss was associated with a 2% risk of knee replacement and a 3% risk of uh, hip replacement. Okay, again, lots and lots of studies, lots and lots and lots and lots of studies that show that even small amounts of weight loss significantly help uh, the likelihood of developing arthritis over time. Okay, happy to provide more data for anyone who wants that information, uh, but just lots and lots of information there. Again, probably working through two mechanisms. One, there's this not this mechanical stress on the joint, but also because it's reducing those in, at low grade systemic inflammation. Okay, so very simple. You want to take care of your cartilage, be sure to maintain a healthy body weight. Okay, physical activity itself okay, can cause is it, is a, and is an effective means of taking care of our cartilage. Okay, recent studies have demonstrated that moderate dynamic loading, that's something as simple as walking or riding a bike, okay, exerts potent anti-inflammatory effects through the suppression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So, uh, just when you go and, and uh, you know, get on a bike for 20 minutes or you go and do some light, light to moderate walking for 20 or 30 minutes, uh, there are some anti-inflammatory chemicals that are released that help to preserve our cartilage. Okay, so the, the active activity itself is protective for the cartilage. Okay, if, 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 knee mus if muscle weakness contributes to cartilage loss, well then it makes sense that muscle strength helps to prevent it and that's certainly the case okay again a lot of studies that that confirm that the stronger we are the stronger and larger the muscles around a joint are the less likely we're going to have cartilage loss over time i'll draw attention to this last study title where there's been a lot of research done it, the, the study you know title is that return to sport quadriceps strength symmetry impacts five-year cartilage integrity after anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. Basically, for those who've had an ACL tear, if we look at the, if we, if we measure their quadriceps strength, and then, you know, look at their cartilage health five years later, if they have similar values, if they have good quadriceps strength on the side of their ACL tear, that's very predictive for how healthy their cartilage is going to look five years from now the greater the loss of strength they have in their thigh muscle, the much more likely they're gonna have, you know, worse cartilage scores five years from now. So all that I say, lots and lots of evidence to say that if we can keep our, our muscles strong, that is very helpful. That's going to be very um, significant for cartilage health over time. Okay, there are some things that we can do via our nutrition. Okay, I'll, I'll breeze through these pretty quickly, but uh, there have been some studies that show that high intakes of total fat and saturated fat may be associated with increased risk of structural knee arthritis, arthritis progression, while mono and polyunsaturated fats may reduce radiographic progression. So saturated fats are going to be, you know, animal fats, so fats found in dairies and red meats or fried foods, right? These kind of fats are going to have a potential to increase cartilage, law, you know, degradation over time. While unsaturated fats, fats in nuts and seeds and olive oils may reduce radiographic progression. Okay. 
Oh, and this was uh, this is another study looking at, you know, if we look at a, a Mediterranean diet again, that's it's going to be a diet that's low on saturated fat, and high in unsaturated fats. Um, you know, low in processed sugars was, you know, found to be protective. So essentially, we want to we want to limit saturated, you know, total fat content and especially saturated fat content. Uh, that may help us to protect our cartilage over time. I feel like most people are going to want to know about certain supplements like uh, glucosamine and chondroitin. I feel like many people have heard of these and are going to want to know, just, are those effective? Uh, this is a very recent review of certain supplements and their proposed effectiveness for cartilage loss. Evidence of the positive effects of glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate is still a matter of debate. Official guidelines have different attitudes towards the use of glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate in the treatment of OA. So, uh, literally, the American guidelines say it's not very effective, you shouldn't use it, and the European guidelines say, yes, that's a good idea, go for it. So this is still a matter of debate in the scientific world. And there is some positive evidence for it. So, uh, these are just a few studies that show that there could be some positive value to glucosamine and chondroitin, and even vitamin D. Uh, these, these uh, I, I leave it at that they have potential to be helpful. Again, it's very debated. We don't know entirely. They, I would just say they have potential to be helpful over time. Um, that's probably as much as my knowledge will take me there. There are a few other things. There are a few other ways that we could possibly um, take care of our cartilage, the ways, that we, way, ways that we move. So perhaps increasing our step rate when we walk or run, taking shorter, shorter strides, but more frequent steps might help us. Or or perhaps our, our shoe wear in, in this study that showed that stable, supportive shoes were more helpful. Almost certainly other factors like stress management and sleep. Uh, you know, if we, if we want to reduce low-grade inflammation, getting quality sleep is almost certainly going to be an important part of that. Um, I, I didn't, I, for, for, for time's sake, I didn't want to go into any more length that I already have here, but uh, there are almost certainly studies out there showing that people who don't sleep properly are going to lose, going to have more risk of arthritis over time. So there are also likely other factors that are important for taking care of our cartilage. But the big three, again, would be physical activity, uh, nutrition, and maintaining a healthy body. Okay, so coming to the end of our presentation, right, cartilage, especially articular hyaline cartilage, is a specialized tissue found at the ends of our bones. It's essential for normal pain-free movement and to protect the, the bones, you know, protect our bones from getting too much pressure in them. Uh, right, cartilage loss is the defining feature of osteoarthritis and something that we want to avoid. It has poor healing potential uh, because of its low blood supply. It doesn't Once we have an injury to it, it can be hard to reverse that. And therefore, it's very important that we take care of it via weight management, uh, you know, proper physical activity and uh, healthy diets. All right, and let's see if I can, uh, I might leave up that slide here. And so now if you, everyone has any questions, now would be the time to, uh, you can put them forth. Angela, give me just a second. I'm trying to see how I can view the chat here. So with the share screen, you might have to look at the top, um, hover at the top, and it might show chat. <clears throat> Give me just a second here. Are you able to read the questions? I'm happy to answer them if you are able to go ahead and see them. I have them pulled up. Um, we don't have any as of yet but okay yeah, um, i think i've okay, i've got it now i think i've stopped sharing my screen okay if anyone has any questions i'd be more than happy to answer anything that i can about uh cartilage can you hear me this is joan sure yes hi I sure can. hi um it, what is uh the remedy if you are already on bone on bone Ah, very good question. That's uh, probably many in our audiences if you're already bone on bone. So, and this is just part of the 
reality, I suppose, in which we, we do deal with in this world. If we cannot rebuild, so once cartilage is, once we've lost cartilage, we can't necessarily, we can't rebuild it. So we do have to, it's, it's a game of preservation. Um, so if, you know, it depends on where the cartilage loss is, but once the cartilage loss does become severe enough, right, the definitive treatment for that would then be something like a joint replacement which can be very effective, uh, which can be for, for certain joints. Uh, you know, work with a lot of uh, people who do have hip and knee replacements and, and you'll be able to find many people who would say that it's done, you know, tremendous uh, value for them. So we can, you know, a joint replacement is sort of the final treatment strategy for someone who is bone, on, who is sort of bone on bone. But we do know, again, we, even if it's not fully a, tr a treatment in the sense of uh, totally getting rid of symptoms, things like you know muscle strengthening, uh, you know weight loss, and proper nutrition can cause symptomatic improvements. Um, so yes, I think there was a question. I think I just saw that uh, in the chat as well. You know, can later treatment uh, help? Absolutely. Uh, even if it's not even if it's not curative in that sense, and make symptomatic improvements. We can't help people feel better via modifying their weight or getting them stronger or changing their diets. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should have another one from Frank. Yes, I see that. Yeah, any specific exercises you would recommend for those lost with uh, knee cartilage? Absolutely. This is where, so in my mind, my answer is yes. And this is also where it becomes difficult on the level of a presentation. Um, just because everyone's, everyone's specific response to exercise is going to be just a bit different. So it'd be a little, it'd be a little tricky just to give some, uh, to give a, to give sort of a list of exercises without knowing the individual. Um, and 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 where they're at. Um, so for someone who's got some more, you know, mild articular cartilage loss, even even things that I think many people would associate with um, with being harmful, you know, things like some squats or step ups or or lunges would be helpful. But again, if if, if the cartilage loss is advanced enough, then you would have to start with a little bit less weight bearing through some leg lifts or. Um, or things where we're not putting quite as much pressure uh, through the bone. And so really, if you have, I would, honestly, I'm, just, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to make too much of a, a shameless plug, but I think if you do have knee cartilage loss and you're struggling to find some ways to exercise, uh, that would be a great opportunity to meet personally with a physical therapist. And I think that's, what, that's, where, phys that's where someone like a physical therapist would be able to um, give you some specifically tailored exercises that would be able to meet meet you where you're at to, to help maximize uh, your cartilage health cartilage health over the long term. Hi Nick. This is James. I have a question for you. Great, go for it. So um, in your presentation, it sounds like to me that meniscus and cartilage are not the same thing. Can you tell me what the difference between uh -huh. those two things are? Uh, very good, very good, uh, very, very astute. Uh, the, so the majority of my presentation dealt with, you may remember that third, we kind of talked about there's different types of cartilage and they're commonly broken down into three different types of elastic cartilage, which you could maybe find in the lobe of your ear or in the bridge of your nose fibrocartilage, which would be like the meniscus, and then uh, hyaline cartilage, which is the cartilage found at the ends of all of our bones. Uh, the, yes, so the meniscus is not hyaline cartilage. It's not, the, the meniscus is actually a, a mobile piece of tissue. I hate to be so, um, in one sense, simplistic or uh, graphic or, uh, or however this sounds, but the next time you have, um, the next time you pick up some chicken from the store, when you bite it, when you cook it, if you cook it the whole, you know, sort of uh, thigh and leg together, you can easily distinguish, you, you, if you had it, you can kind of easily distinguish the meniscus, which is 
mobile and can move and, and detaches from the bone versus the hyaline cartilage, which is going to look different than the bone, but at the same time, it's, it's so wound up in the bone itself. And so it's just a different kind of cartilage. Um, they, 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 yeah, it's, uh, it's just a different kind of cartilage. They're both made up, they, they both do classify as cartilage, uh, but the properties are a little bit different. If you lose meniscus, if you have, we, what we do know is that if you have an injury to the meniscus, that is likely, that, that, that is highly likely to lead to articular, you know, the articular cartilage loss over time. So they're not the same. They do have some different properties. Someone who is a, uh, a little bit smarter scientist could tell you, could, could give you the details on the difference between the two. Um, you, you have articular cartilage, I should say this. So you have articular cartilage um, on essentially everywhere between your bones, right? So in your wrist joint or your ankle joint, right? At the ends of those bones, you have articular cartilage that helps to provide the cushioning and shock absorber, but you don't have a meniscus in your, in your ankle. You don't have a meniscus in your wrist, right? So that meniscus tissue is only going to be found in a very, in a very, small number of places. Whereas at the ends of all of our bones, we're gonna have that articular highlight. Okay. All right. Actually, Nick, I was gonna kind of, um, just through my experience, um, Kind of maybe would you be interested in talking a little bit about some of the non-surgical approaches such as steroid injections and things like that? Um, what's your opinion about those and things? Good question, good question. So Yeah, don't want to step on too many toes. Uh, I don't. I, I do think so. In the case of an, I would say that in a case of an, an acute, uh, an acute flare-up. So, uh, in the case where the symptoms are significantly elevated, I do think something like a steroid injection can be helpful to help reduce some of the inflammatory chemicals that can be circulating that um, might cause pain. Uh, but to my knowledge, thing, you know, there's no, certainly long-term a steroid injection, and I think even providers who provide these things, no, no one would ever recommend that as a long-term solution. Uh, but even, even treatments like um, PRP injections or prolotherapy, uh, I did not, again, to, to, because of the scope of the presentation, I did not go as I did not do a, a deep, deep dive into some of these alternative interventions, uh, but to my knowledge, the evidence is fairly clear that so far to date, these have yet to be shown effective. Um, Thank you. I suppose yet to be shown effective is not quite the same thing as shown not to be effective, <laughs> uh, but again, because I don't offer them, I'm not uh, quite as well versed in the literature on those subjects. Um, but almost certainly they will fare inferior to uh, the staples of diet, exercise, and, um, you know, and healthy. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Well, um, I think we will wrap things up for today. Um, I will send out the recording. Um, to everyone and um, along with, you know, Nick's email or anything along those lines, if you have any questions that you think of after the fact, um, I'm sure, you know, we'll be happy to answer that. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Um, yes, uh, it, like I said, Angela, my, I, I can put my email in the chat if that's helpful, but uh, oh, sure. Anyways, be, sure, be more than happy to yeah, be of whatever service I can be to anyone who has interest in this subject. And thanks so much for everyone coming out and listening. Yeah, thank you guys so much. All right. Thank you guys.